first, I would like to introduce our moderator, Kyle Sherrick. He is host of the Emmy-winning television show, Wisconsin Foodie, currently in its ninth season on PBS. 11th. 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 Oh, excuse me. 11th season. That's wrong. <laughs> we didn't think we'd make it this far, so. <laughs> Uh, 11th season on PBS and broadcast primetime to millions of households. His widely acclaimed video web series, Chef Talk, with Kyle Sherrick features candid, forthright, and often amusing conversations with some of America's most engaging chefs. As a culinary historian, food enthusiast, and storyteller, Kyle explores where our food comes from and how it shapes who we are. Kyle has appeared as a food judge on the Travel Channel, a, a commentator pundit on the Cooking Channel, and is a regular media contributor and essayist on NPR. Our first panelist, Adam Siegel, is Bartolotta's Lake Park Bistro's executive chef. Originally from Chicago, he has worked on both U.S. coasts with James Beard award-winning chefs and in Michelin star restaurants in Italy and France. In 2000, Adam started as a chef de cuisine at Bartolotta's Lake Park Bistro. In 2005, Adam also took over the kitchen at Bacchus, another Bartolotta restaurant, as its executive chef, broadening his repertoire into contemporary American food. In 2007, he returned to France to work with acclaimed chefs in Bordeaux and Paris. In 2008, Chef Siegel won the prestigious James Beard Award for Best Chef Midwest. Chef Siegel has cooked with some of the best chefs in the country. In 2009, he hosted Top Chef Dinner in Milwaukee with season three and four winners. Thomas Keller shared a kitchen with Adam in 2009, and in 2010, Chef Siegel was on the guest of No Reservations with host Anthony Bourdain. Adam took Bourdain around town and showed him off the cuisine that made Milwaukee famous. Our second panelist, Charles Ford, is the general manager of SKY Restaurant in Chicago. Charles received his associate's degree in culinary arts and bachelor's degree in hospitality management. He worked his way through school as a line cook, then transitioned to service, bussing tables, and moved his way up. He was offered the position of assistant manager at the Bristol, where he eventually became general manager and wine director during his five-year tenure. In 2014, Charles received the Jean Baget nomination for Best Sommelier, as well as a spot on Zagat's 30 Under 30 list in 2015. Our third panelist, uh, Einav Geffen, is Executive Corporate Chef for Unilever Food Solutions North America. Her career began 20 years ago when she worked as a pastry chef at Orna and Ella in T Tel Aviv, Israel. She also worked as a sous chef at the acclaimed Mouliam restaurant in Tel Aviv. Chef Geffen is a graduate of the Institute of Culinary Education, a place she went back to later as an instructor to train other aspiring chefs in all aspects of cooking and presentation. Chef Geffen, excuse me, Chef Geffen has completed um, on the acclaimed Food Network's CHOP show and has led a popular TED Talk. In 2008, Chef Geffen joined Unilever as the corporate head chef for North America, where she leads a team of chefs in charge of development of innovation, product rejuvenation, and deployment of global projects. Fair Kitchens is a movement that was started by Unilever. Research conducted by Unilever revealed that people were leaving our industry because of daily deprivations that were causing serious impacts of the well-being of our employees, our coworkers, and our friends. Fair Kitchens is a movement of chefs supporting chefs to inspire a new kitchen culture. Today's very transparent discussion is about championing the well-being of those working in our industry. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel and our moderator, Kyle Sherrick. Thank you, Kyle. That Thank was you. a great introduction. Um, if you have not been to his restaurant, House of Gerhard, in Kenosha, go. Uh, it's exceptional in regards to German food. If you're looking for some great Mexican, it's up the road a little ways, but he's the German. <laughs> yeah, it's really terrific. Uh, thanks, panel, for being here. I know many of you. Adam, you didn't come very far, but the other two, the rest, yeah, yeah. Thank you, both Charles About and Annette. two blocks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to start this discussion uh, with a, um, no pun intended, with a sobering fact. But um, a study that was done by the, uh, uh, and I want to get this name correct, the Institute for Addiction and Alcoholism of America in conjunction with Georgetown University from 2008 to 2015 um, 
uh, it was essentially a survey reaching out to a, a really wide sampling within um, industries. It's the most definitive survey about addiction and depression and chemical dependency within industries ranked. So this is during past month illicit drug use and alcohol among adults between 18 and 64 employed full time in industry by category. Public administration is the lowest at 4.3%. Uh, the wholesale trade is 7.8% in the middle, and accommodations and food service is the largest category at 19.1%, followed by arts, entertainment, and recreation at 13.7%, and then management, whatever that means, at 12.1%. Um, pretty powerful statistics. In uh, hospitality um, and in that environment, uh, any, first of all, how many of you are restaurant tours or work in that aspect, either in service and management, uh, uh, bartending, so something to that effect? Just hands really high, please. Okay, great. And, and then I'm assuming the rest of you are, are either uh, maybe in a wholesale aspect or working with you, but you're all within the hospitality industry, correct? Yeah, so we're, um, those of you, all of us, are, are surrounded by um, uh, very stressful situations. Um, uh, and for the most part, alcohol is really the drug that is used to take care of that stress at the end of the day. Um, it's been an interesting update within the industry, I think almost uh, poetically in line with some of the Me Too awareness that's also working through the industry. Um, but with things, uh, and, and then I'll turn over to questions from the panel, and if you have any perspective on some of the things that I mentioned. But with moments like um, Sean Brock and, and Travis Grimes' restaurant group, uh, not too long ago, where they had an employee, a, a GM, drinking at the bar post-closing, um, getting into his car, heading home across that bridge in uh, the Carolinas, and swerving and, and killing someone. Now, that's tragic <coughs> enough in itself, but the restaurant group, just from a business standpoint, was found guilty uh, and had to remunerate the, the family of the person that was killed to the tune of $1.1 million because it was deemed by the judge that that uh, employee was essentially overserved even though he was off the clock. There was a point at which um, it was apparent that he shouldn't have had anything more to drink, and some of it was on the onus, onus of the establishment. Um, and even at that point, if he had continued to drink, it should have been call for a cab, call for an Uber, you know, those sorts of things. So I want to open up the discussion, one, to just your experience and perspectives on how the industry has been coming to terms with this, from any of you, whoever wants to lead, and then some perspectives on where are the lines within um, the employee-employer relationship within just substance use. I'm not trying to vilify having a drink or a cocktail or a glass of wine or anything like that. Um, and I'm not going to get into the illegal substance debate because that's just not what this is about. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, it is a serious discussion and it's something that every business has to create some boundaries for within their employees. So Absolutely. the floor is open. It's a constant battle, you know, the, the, what's going on in the industry with, with uh, substance abuse or you know, drink, you know, just drinking. Um, and you have to just take those problems on hand right away. You have to start with knowing your employees, knowing what to, to look for, the signs and everything, and being in constant, you know, communication with them. But it's also making sure that you set boundaries and guidelines as to what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And, you know, you, you can't just expect them to punch in and everything is great every day and punch out and everything's going to be great when they leave. You have to constantly, you know, know your staff. And it's important for managers and chefs to not just be a manager or a chef when they're in the restaurant with them, but to think of them outside of the restaurant. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to just, you know, at the end of the day, go to you know, drink your, your problems away, and, and a lot of people end up doing that. It's not just a shift drink or, or anything like that. You know, they, you, we work odd hours, we work long hours, and you spend a lot of time together, and you know, what's there to do afterwards? You go out and drink or eat and hang out, and 
you know, one turns into two, two turns into three, and, you know, it keeps going all night long, and that, that's how the, the habits form, and you just have to, you know, let, teach your staff as best as you can, you know, that those habits aren't always the best, best route. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I think there, there it's such a it's a complex matter, right? Um, there are things they're drinking on premises, they're drinking off premises. Uh, there are things that needs to be kind of drawn of what is acceptable. Is it one drink or none at all? When even you're off the clock, but you're on premises, but there is not much you can do when your team goes out and have a drink, you know, two bars down the road. Mm -hmm. This is where being proactive rather than reactive is called for. Um, and this is what we try with Fur Kitchen is to build this training that uh, Chef Adam talks about because the, you can train your staff and tell them, hey, listen, you know, this is irresponsible. We, we, I actually said train your staff, but it reminded me that we talked to a chef from New Jersey that we filmed uh, last week, and he said, we're not training staff, we're training people. Mm -hmm. So I think if we start by thinking about it, you're not training staff, you are training people, we are people. You finish a service, how many nights? I finished the service, it's 1.30 or 2 p.m., your like, adrenaline rush is starting to wind down, and this is where you're like, okay, I need a drink just to, like, so I can call it a day, otherwise I'll be all right. wired two, three hours more down the road. How do you know when to stop? When do you feel, how do you have a team responsibility for each other, even if you guys go out, you know, me as a chef, I'm not there. Um, but it's also recognizing if somebody has a problem on your team, recognizing the signs of knowing that there is a problem. And then comes the question, and that's what we hear a lot from the industry, what do I do? If you don't have an HR, if you don't have somebody to talk to, what do I do as, as a restaurant owner uh, or as a chef? Am I leaving somebody to hang? Do I fire them? Do I offer them help? So this is all, it's, it's a complex question that we need to solve as an industry. Charles, do you have uh, any input? Uh, so running a small restaurant, I think there's a big difference of running a, a, a corporate group. <clears throat> a corporate group, you know, they have strict guidelines and, you know, you have to follow certain rules and there's a whole heck of, there's a lot of documentation that goes on with that. Uh, being in a small restaurant, and by small, you know, we have, we're an 88-seater on the south side, um, it's full immersion for, for Chef and myself and, and we have to get to... Every single day, we're going to have one or two of our coworkers come in with problems that have nothing to do with the restaurant. It's just life. And we've accepted that fact. And if you can immerse yourself uh, into, into all of those issues and, you know, be that father figure or that mother figure um, that you need to be, the most important thing is to get your staff to trust you enough so that they can tell you their problems. Um, and that's a process in itself. Um, so you have to be their best friend. Uh, you have to be their, um, their mentor. You have to be their most trusted um, secret keeper. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to, and we do that for 28 people. And it's a, that in itself is a full-time job. Um, but for us, it's <clears throat> get to know your employees better than they know themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a job every day. It's and if really we, important. Yeah, if we can, if we can do that, um, then we have a successful shift every service. Um, but we expect it every single day. Some, there's, an, there's an issue, and that, whether that be substance and alcohol abuse, uh, serious family problems, you know, spouse problems, brother, sister, all that kind of stuff. Just getting to work in Chicago is hard. You know? <laughs> and then you're throwing all those other things. So we just try to be trusted confidants of, of every single person uh, that works in the restaurant from top to bottom. Doesn't matter if you're a host dishwasher, uh, all the way up to, you know, the owner. So that's its own uh, incredibly difficult balance. And hospitality, uh, as a craft, I adore because um, th there's no hiding behind it. I always, uh, I consider chefs, and this is just specific to the chef profession. Though I think it can move forward into certainly uh, psalms and 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 uh, mixtures of cocktails and and uh, even definitely to servers. In that it's one of the last great professions where. Uh, pardon the phrase, but your bullshit has to walk right away. When you, when you come into a kitchen, when you come into a bar, when you present about wine, when you, you, say, you know, if you say you're ex good, uh, you either are or everyone will know that you're not within about 10 minutes. And so that authenticity, I think, is really fantastic. However, within the industry, the only way to move ahead in both financially and then sort of 
up the you know, career chain is by being exceptional and getting to a higher position. So that brings it with it an inherent level of stress that most careers do not have on a day-to-day-to-day-to-day-to-minute-by-minute um, experience. Also, it's a very insular culture. And as Chef Siegel said, you don't work regular hours. You, you become your own tribe because you are missing Thanksgiving and Christmas and weekends and, and so forth. And the way often to decompress and the way to be rewarded often in the industry is with a toast, right? I mean, to oversimplify it. So um, how do you thread that <laughs> needle through healthy culture, take care of yourself, um, but also embrace these flavors and what we've all worked for. I mean, any restaurant with a fantastic seller is eminently proud of its fantastic seller. Um, but uh, don't drink too much wine at the end of the day. But then come back and be 100% after six hours of sleep or less the next day. Uh, I know this is a hard question, but, but this is the reality of the industry. That's what this panel is here right. for. Yeah, but does it have to be the reality? Right, so you know, we live in a reality that was created and evolved to be that reality. And the question moving forward, because the truth is there, we are we less and less people joining this industry. You know, not that the Food Network days are, mm. you know, a decade or more in, and you know, people don't want to graduate or do they still do graduate a celebrity from school, but then they enter a restaurant and it's a whole different world than what they thought it's going to be. Um, does it? Does it have to be the reality, or can it sustain your, their, itself with that type of a reality? And I think we see the first signs that, no, it cannot. I cannot tell you how many operators stopped by our booth and said, labor, labor, mm -hmm. labor, you know, which I cannot get people, I can't retain people. It's, it's my, my chef's onboarding, onboarding, onboarding. And then as a chef, you, you spend more energy in training, 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 and over-rotating door of talent and, and with running a business, with running a kitchen, with, at the end, you're success, you need to be a successful business. We walk on a very tight rope of margins right. in the food industry. Right. It's just a reality. One of, of the tightest, I you know, think, probably. Probably one yeah. of the tightest. So. And the yeah. stress is always there. It never yeah. leaves. It's, it's just learning how to, right. to deal with it for the most part. It, you and know, it's, it's opening it's, day every day. It's, but, every you know, day. I mean, there's stress in every profession. It's, you know, we have a little bit more of a high stress because, you know, you have full a dining room full of guests who want to all eat at the same time and you know your cook's having a bad day or this server's having a bad day and you're you know you you were shorted on on so much food in your orders and you know you your electricity went out for an hour and you know all those things that you deal with and you still want to make it as perfect as possible for the guests because after all it's the hospitality industry and you're there to serve a product and to give them an experience and so you carry that stress with you because you know, it's just like when you have company over at your house, you're not just going to, you know, open up a bag of chips and throw a, you know, a pre-made thing of guac on the mm -hmm. counter and say, you know, come over and have, the, you know, a nice meal with me. You want to empty it out into a bowl and make it look as presentable as possible. You want to, you know, put forth effort and you're always met with challenges and learning to deal with that stress is, is one of the hardest things to teach to, to the staff because, you know, there's so many different ways you can go about the you know, the stress, you know, the biggest thing that I say to, to, to my chefs when, you know, they're, they're looking anxious or panicked or anything, I just say, remember, it's just dinner. That's all it is. It's just dinner, you know, and if somebody's going to get that upset over something, you know, and, and, you know, it's not worth it. And Scott Williams, who's a manager that, that I work with, we always said that to each other when we worked together at Lake Park Bistro over the years when there was a you know, situation, he would always say, remember, it's just dinner. Hmm. And that always calmed me down. Hmm. You know, and it, it, it's finding you know, little things that you could do for people that, that make them you know, not have to deal with the stress in a negative way. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's something that's really important because it, you know, that stress leads into so many other things, which is depression, anxiety, and, you know, and, and those are the things that really cause the bigger problems because when you're, you have that stress and, or the anxiety or the depression and then you're starting to, to drink or use other you know, outlets, it, it really makes for a bad work environment because you're bringing that into the work environment, you're bringing that into other people's lives, you're bringing that into your life and you, know, you, you, you have to figure out how to, to work with those 
you know, situations is, is the hmm. main thing for me. Hmm. I, I think it goes back to what, Charles, what you said about trust. And it's not a given that you, you earn somebody's trust enough that your worker, your dishwasher, your prep guy can come and say, I'm hungover. I, I'm, I have a bad day. I can't, you know, it's, you, yes, it's a problem you have to deal with. But first, you need to create an environment where somebody can come and say that. I, I know in my days in the kitchen, that wasn't the environment. Hmm. You keep your head down, you keep your mouth shut, and you plow through it, and you execute. And whatever it is that you have to deal with stays out of the kitchen, and you can deal with it afterwards. Um, you know, but so creating an environment of trust when somebody can come and say, I have a problem at home, I have a, a bad day, um, you know, you may tell this person, listen, I need you, I need you to deliver tonight, let's talk after service, because, you, you know, but at least somebody senses that there is an outlet. It's, it, it sounds minute, but it, it, it's a pressure cooker. A kitchen is a pressure cooker, a restaurant, you know, in holistically, it's, you gotta, it's like being on every evening. So is that, a, is that a new thing in restaurants? Because my time on boots on the ground in hospitality, uh, nobody, I mean, <laughs> whatever the hell happened outside of my life was my problem. Mm -hmm. And then I had to deliver while I was there. And, um, and I don't, I mean, that's just how it was. And now having been around restaurants to the depth that I have through the show and other things, it has changed. But is it as a result because there is such a labor shortage or are we becoming more decent human beings? Is there more competition? So, like, what, what all are the, the above, you know, it, it, you know, the kitchens, and you know, even in the early two thousands to to the nineties and eighties, and I think it, it, as they were all, they were so much different. It was, you know, back then it was more more so being in the army and, mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah, you weren't gonna description. you weren't gonna Brigade. tell your, you weren't gonna tell your sergeant you're having a bad day, right. you know, because. They were going to tell you where you could go and mm -hmm. get, back to, get back to work. <laughs> exactly. And the, 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 the line that I heard was the flag outside says you can quit any time. Right. Yeah. But, you know, I, I mean, so because of, you know, and that was the mentality because they had a job to do and you had to do it to the best and they didn't want to hear about any other problems other than what might be in the restaurant at that time or, you know, how you were feeling or anything like that. That is changing because, you know, it's it's a industry of humans and you, you, you have to realize that you can't make that stuff go away and you can't shut it down completely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's always going to be there and if you want to have a better product and you want to have people who care about the product, then you need to make sure that those people are, you know, okay mentally, you mm -hmm. know, because if they're not okay mentally, then that's going to show through in the product that's being served as well and, you know, the hospitality that's given, you know, you know, Way back in the day, you know, you yelled at a server, I'm guilty of it, and you made them feel bad. They then went to in front of that guest and then they, they you know, weren't feeling 100 percent and that translated to that to that guest and that's just not worth it for for anyone. And mm -hmm. so you always have to look at it from a different point of view. And, you know, it took me a while to, to figure that out because of the, the school or the camp that I that I was trained in had that mentality, but you know, it's, it definitely has changed over the years, and I'm glad it has, because you have to take that all into consideration. I mean, a lot of it is also growing up, as you, as you, you know, have children of your own and everything, you, you realize that, that your employees are kind of, a lot of the times, like your children or family, and you don't want to treat your family that way. Yeah. So I gotta would excuse treat... myself real quick. I'll yeah. be right back. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, why would you want to treat your family that way, so? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I want to pivot a little bit to talk about um, some other things that the industry has come to terms with. Um, in preparing for this, there was, I ran across a great story that NPR's The Salt uh, Bureau did, um, where there was a sh the chef, again, it's in, it's in, Car in the Carolinas, in, in Charleston, but um, a chef for a restaurant group, a verisimilitude to, to uh, your position, um, was suffering from depression and took his own life. And in response, the owners, and again, it was, it was two owners, not unlike Joe and Paul, um, started, uh, well, started a group called Ben's Friends and, and, and a number of other aspects and reached out to the industry and basically said, uh, we thought we knew this guy. Um, 
we all struggle with depression at some point in our lives. There isn't a single human being that's immune from it. Uh, and if you are, you, you just maybe haven't left your house. I mean, it's just part of being human. Um, but uh, and uh, that tied in with um, Anthony Bourdain's suicide. Uh, now, here's, here's someone who was still in the industry but not actively cooking with the exception of the events and things like that that he was doing. Um, certainly knew the industry and applauded a lot of that um, chemical-fueled release at the end of the day and, in his own words, bro culture, and was coming to terms with, I think, some of that uh, near the end of his life. But <clears throat> it's, it's easy to say that no one takes their life if they're feeling at the top of their game. Uh, mm -hmm. He was most likely right. deep in depression at the time. So um, this is really just the tip of the iceberg of how the industry is coming to terms with it. But you're both leading some large organizations. So how are you, your colleagues, what's the thought that's going on there about how this can be approached as well, as it either ties in with chemical use or, or just as a separate issue? Uh, I mean, I, quite frankly, I had uh, somebody who you know, worked for me and very closely last summer who took his own life, and that was one of the hardest things that I ever had to go through as a chef, and I didn't see the signs. And you know, I, all I could do is you know replay the last you know several months in my head of working closely with him to see if he showed any. And you know, you you do never know what someone's thinking. I, I mean, I was would have never thought that uh, that something like that would have happened. I knew that you know he had his moments of not being happy and wanting to be further along where he, than where he was, but he was getting there. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, you, you can't, it, it's almost impossible to see everything um, at a, all the time. And, you know, sometimes some people don't always show you the, the signs or the, the clues, or you just don't know how to, to look for them yourself, you know. And I, I thought I was rather, you know, experienced, knew people well enough, and, and understood everything. And, you know, I always made sure that I spoke to all my chefs, you know, routinely when I was in the restaurants. And, you know, for somebody that I worked with closely all the time, you know, would have never thought something like this ha would happen. And, you know, I have a very good friend who's a, a, a police detective, and he actually was on that case, and he said, you would have never known with some people, you know, with, hmm. with, with this, and, you know, you know, because some people are just live such a private life that they don't want you to know. And they, you know, some of their, you know, one of their goals is making sure that they act the complete opposite around the people that might be able to do something to help them. And those are, that's when you have to even sometimes take a deeper dive into to people and really get to know them and not just take, you know, when somebody says, you know, I'm doing fine, I'm doing great today, you, you know, try and get to know them a little bit more you know, on a personal level, so that you, you, you know, that they might open up to you a little bit more. And that's what I learned from that experience, is trying to, to learn who, who, who the people are that you're working with every day. Mm -hmm. um, because you never know what's, what they're going through or how they're feeling or, or anything like that. And, you know, again, you take that depression and you couple it with, uh, you know, the alcohol or, or whatever, substance abuse, and or just the stress of the industry, you know, you're, you're, you're fueling the fire. And it, it doesn't, you know, most of the time it can't lead to anything good. Mm -hmm. And if you were nodding your head knowingly, hmm. it seemed, so what? Oh. I, I want to take a step back first because, you know, when we launched Fair Kitchen, it was very clear that we do not want to paint our industry in the doom and gloom no. of, you know, it's very important to remember that we love food, we choose to be, in that industry because of our passion well, and hospitality for the hospitality sake. I yeah. mean it's yeah we're yeah. most of the time you know, we, we are love, happy yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Most of the we're time taking we're happy. care of it's not all like ooh yeah. but there are fundamental issues um, that we need to address that I think up till now we either ducked down or didn't want to uh, fa uh, face head on to really make sure that we're sustaining it. So it's very important for me to just say, you know, it's not right. all like boo-hoo, you know, we're all <laughs> depressed and, you know, we're all drink at the end of the day. Um, no. The sad Charlie Brown music, right? Yeah. We're all walking around <laughs> like Linus. Yeah. But, you know, having said that, because 
I mean, people will have depression, will have things outside of their life they may not bring to work, and that's true to any line of work, but somehow in a kitchen, in this environment, in this overstressed you know, environment, it may be amplified. Um, and lack of sense of fulfillment and sometimes sleep deprivation and you know can all just charge whatever it is that is going on anyway um, you know so you're right there, there are times where you know you cannot you, you won't see those people that really want to hide addiction or depression from you are very skilled in, do, in doing that but if you create an environment or a workplace where either you talk about it or say guys listen whatever is going on in your life there are resources out there, you know, mm -hmm. that may not be me, may not be the chef, may not, if you don't feel comfortable. There are other resources out there, you know, hotlines and, and, and chat rooms and, and Facebook page that are confidential that you can put yourself out there and at least ask for help or seek advice and, you know, do something before, I mean, how many people need to die in this industry for us to wake up and say, we got to do something, you know, right. it's, it's, that's, unfortunately, it's only when it gets to that barometer of disaster that you're like, oh my God, oh my God, you know, we mm -hmm. got to do that. But there is no need, there are things that you can do to be proactive and to be preventative. And sometimes there are signs that you may detect, and this is where you need to ask somebody, how are you? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm okay, I'm okay. But if your gut tells you differently, take them aside, are you really okay? Are you yeah. okay, are you doing okay? I, I'm, I, I feel that something is, I want you to know that you can come and talk to me anytime. Yeah. Sometimes that moves the dial, you know, that it's not just, I, feel, I always feel like it's the security at the airport, and maybe it's the Israeli in me, the, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> But you know, you try, you, did you pack your bags? You know, they don't even look at you, right? It's your body language that usually tells the story. If you know to identify some of those signs, Interesting. you know, you, you can create that environment or create that space when somebody may feel safe enough yeah. to open up and then you may be able to help somebody. And uh, I'm not trying to disparage the culinary arts, but there isn't a lot of emotional intelligence training mm -hmm. uh, for chefs, GMs, you know, managers, owners, that sort of thing. Um, because there are so many demands in just building a business. But There's none. What's that? <clears throat> There's none. none. Okay. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So we had pivoted and, and, be, and talked about depression within the industry, and I know you, mm. have, you have your own unique story within that. But I'd, I'd started it off <clears throat> with, um, with Chef Murphy, who had, had taken his life uh, down in the Carolinas in that restaurant group mm -hmm. and stepping up with Ben's friends and other... Um, essentially coping groups saying mm -hmm. we are unique within the workplace mm -hmm. and we would like to be an outreach for people around the country who can speak to this but there's some simpatico when someone gets on a conference call from Northern California and says you know the 18 hour days are crushing me uh, and someone in wherever uh, Newport Rhode <coughs> Island said I understand what that's like and here's how I'm dealing with it that's part of what they started mm. I think the biggest thing is that the long days are tough. There's no doubt about that. The most, the, the biggest impact that I've seen with other employees and coworkers is not necessarily it's those tough days themselves, but <clears throat> what is happening before service and after service. That really, it's a combination of those small little things that can take you over the edge. So. <clears throat> a long 16-hour day isn't necessarily, you know, a death sentence, but when you do that long 16-hour day, and then you got to fight to get back home, uh, and then, of course, you throw in a couple of drinks here and there, or other substances, things like that, <clears throat> and then you throw in other people, say you've got family issues, or you've got uh, spouse issues, or things like that, or uh, you're just lonely, uh, and you have so much idle time on your hands after that. You throw all those things together, and it's a, it can be a pretty volatile cocktail. Um, you know, pardon my vocabulary, it's the wrong word, but, you know, it really sets itself up for that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I've been through it. <clears throat> I've been to the darkest spots I've ever been in my life, and I learned a lot from it. Uh, a, a lot of it had to, there was a lot of self-realization that, you know, Life is all about balance, and you have to make sure. I think chefs especially, um, they just go and go, and sometimes I don't know how you guys do it. Um, and it's like, I don't, there's like this iron curtain. 
you know, and 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 <clears throat> most of most mostly they act that way because that's the way that's what they right. saw. It, mm -hmm. catches, it does catch and, up you know, to you. Though. Yeah, and it, yeah, we you don't know. know there is another way. And you kind of imitate that, just the same way I would imitate my my mentors, um, the the GMs that I worked for that I wanted to be so bad. Uh, and you are a stone wall. If anybody sees you having a bad day, well, then you've you've failed because you can't show weakness. Mm -hmm. uh, especially in a restaurant, especially in the big city, where you have to be on every single, you know, every single day. Well, there's always somebody who wants your job. You know, that's always the, right. So, yep. Right. <clears throat> that's, that's, Thirty people waiting for you yep. to right. fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how in that? I mean, this seems hopeless, but I know it isn't. How do you uh, cultivate a um, a culture of vulnerability, mm -hmm. uh, but not run a daycare? And I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but you know, you're not you're not there for group <coughs> therapy. You're there to put exceptional cuisine and service out uh, seven days a week or five or so, whatever it is. Um, but still, you want to have the best people mm -hmm. that follow your mission and feel uh, cuisine, hospitality is about heart. I mean, if you don't have that, you don't have anything. So how do you, <laughs> how do you pull all those together? For me, it all starts with hiring and knowing the people. Uh, we rarely, I don't think I hire by resume anymore uh, at all. Uh, my, an, an interview with me is a conversation. And I want to know how you're going to converse with me, and, and, be, and I'm going to try and see the kind of person you are. Uh, and it start, that's where it starts for us. I also think um, in today's world, you do have to run a daycare. If you're going to be a GM <laughs> or you're going to be a chef, you have to make it OK for those staff members to screw up. Mm. Uh, we've written up somebody once in the last year and a half. Uh, not to say that many write upable offenses have occurred in the restaurant, but when your staff member sees the fact and understands the fact that they did something very wrong that they could have gotten or written up for in any other restaurant, but when they see that you are trying to level with them and just teach them uh, instead of saying, well, this is a mistake, sign right here, you do it again, we're gonna let you go. Well, that's hopeless, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it gives people this, it just doesn't give people the right motivation when they're coming into work. Uh, and if you can kind of put that to the wayside and have a conversation with somebody, you know, uh, about it and just be eye to eye, level with people, usually you figure out that the most, of the, most of the issues that come up in the restaurant actually have nothing to do with the restaurant. Usually they're outside problems being brought into the restaurant and the restaurant is just where it all comes to a head and you know, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? It happens almost every day right. at the restaurant. While you're you know? trying to please Phil Vitale and maybe get noticed exactly. by the beards and everybody else. Exactly, yeah. And, yeah. And, you have to, and then you have to have a smile on your face. Right, um, right. But, but we try to, at the restaurant, uh, we try to just be honest, and uh, one of my favorite things for us that we started, it's in the rule book, in the manual, when you get to the restaurant every day, before you even get started, you punch in and you say hi to every single person in the restaurant. That is hmm. the rule, and I hold everybody to that standard. At the same time, every single day you leave, you, say, you put on your things, and you say goodbye to every single person. And you wouldn't believe yeah. how many issues that resolves when that's the rule and, and I enforce that rule and I, you have to say goodbye after somebody you got into it with during a certain shift it really makes you focus on what's important I have know. to Adam was talking about raising kids we have the same rule at home and uh, we put it in right. about three years ago and you know when you have then a nine and a ten year old that would kill each other strangle each other uh, if left <laughs> alone to have to look each other in the eye yep. and say Goodbye. Goodbye. Have or yep. yeah. Or hello. It's, it's it's absolutely it's incredibly powerful. We've seen it turn into now. <clears throat> everybody looks forward to that moment. Yeah. And you get and and now it's no longer just a hi or a bye. It's a hug. It becomes a moment of bonding because then you throw in a little joke or a something. Exactly. Or, yeah. We made it through. Yep. We're okay. Yep. And I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. And it's it's crazy how you see those tiny little things have these monstrous impacts. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really, it's beautiful to see. And mm -hmm. it's like those small little things that we try to be kind of, like, that we try to figure out, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as we go. You're, it's always as you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, one quick comment on that, and I, I don't want to single out uh, Adam's restaurant group, but that's where the experience happens, so I'll just be honest. 
it was uh, one of your newer restaurants opening and there was a new hire. And I said, where did you work before? And he listed off a bunch of very corporate-y kind of places. Um, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but what he was delighted about was Family Meal. All of the other places he had worked, he, they had never cared enough to give him sustenance through his shift. And the dignity that he got out of that and that was portrayed to him was, I mean, I can't even put it into words. It was so meaningful to me to witness. And yeah. he said, these people really care. So, so, I mean, that's an important part of the, part of the day. I mean, one, you're, yes, you're going over and shift notes and whatever, you know, any teaching moments that need to happen, but you're bringing everyone together. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're, basically, you're breaking bread together, and that's one of the most important, you know, things that you can do is, is, is eat together. Yeah. And, you know, I always, you know, sometimes, you know, in the nicer weather, some of the cooks go outside and everything. I always try and encourage them to go back inside and sit with everyone. But as long as there's, like, you know, there's groups together and everything, you know, that's really important that they, you know, they're, they're building a team, they're building, you know, relationships, but they're also speaking about, you know, things at work and things outside of work. And it, it That's helps. a big thing, too, in family meal. You mm -hmm. can always, when it's family meal time <clears throat> at a restaurant, you know exactly who's having a bad day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the people who, you know. Off it's, over by themselves. Exactly. It's the pe you know, and they'll give you the, oh, I'm doing fine. No way. That's, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and it's, it's, it's so, e we forget as human beings, we're so uh, visible, you know, in plain yeah. sight. We're so, we're like, most of us wear our emotions on our sleeves, and I have a hard time too. Like, man, there's so many times where I come in to work, and you can just see it on my face. And everybody else has those same days too. And just addressing it right away and saying, "Hey, let's just go. Let's go talk real quick." And it's like those sort of immediate things. Being able to do that that helps. I mean, it just does. It works wonders uh, for your staff to make them. You know, I mean, it's just one of those things. Hmm. A little off topic, but. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's so very true. You, you have thoughts? Never. Uh, <laughs> why would I? Um, too much effort. Um, it's, it, so much that you know, Charles and, and, and Adam are saying is it, it sounds really basic now that I'm crossed to the dark side, to the corporate world, right? That you you are being given those tools when you know they teach you how to be a leader. But in the essence, when when you run business, doesn't matter if it's a GM or a kitchen or a restaurant group, you are a leader. Mm -hmm. You lead a team, a team looks up to you, you set a tone, and, and we often get caught up in the details, mm -hmm. um, and we don't remember that we are leaders, and there are people that will follow our cue or will have to execute what we're saying, and how and what are two different things. Um, and when we, when we build for kitchens with external chefs, because yes, I work in restaurants, but I'm not in the kitchen every day, and we wanted to bring that perspective in, so uh, we called chefs that are run what we called progressive kitchens uh, throughout the US. It came down to the fact that it's those little things. So, you know, we build the code of conduct that is under the acronym TEAMS, and reading it can be like, really? That simple? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's that simple. It goes to ask how you're doing, really look up from your cutting board, or, you know, whatever it is you're doing, and look somebody in the eye when mm -hmm. you ask how he is, say you did a great job today because rewarding and recognition is much more important than compensation. Mm. And we tend to forget that. Yes, money, everybody wanna make money, but for people to know that they are valued mm -hmm. and not just taken for granted in, in a kitchen or front of house is priceless. Not, there is no dollar amount that can be attached to somebody, your, your boss, your chef, your GM says, you did a great job today. You swell with pride, mm -hmm. you know? So the, the, I, I think it's, we, we tend to forget those things that we can apply at home or with our kids. And somehow, <clears throat> just because it's a restaurant and because we're so being swallowed by the mundane of running a restaurant, um, we, we tend to forget. Yeah. I think as human beings too, especially as, uh, you know, as chefs and general managers, there are people that work within our restaurants that you know, <clears throat> we may think are bad apples or have terrible attitudes or, or actually we probably maybe pick on them <clears throat> or critique them a little bit more than other people. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, oh, they've got it coming, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and 
a while back, I learned that that's the first warning sign as a, as a manager or a leader for you to engage those people. Mm. If that's the way you think about that, then you need to actually meet in the middle and get their story. Yeah. <clears throat> that's, that does a lot for employee ret retention mm -hmm. uh, as well. Instead of <clears throat> kind of feeding that divide, saying, all right, let's meet in the middle. If I think this way about you, you probably think this way about me. Right. Uh, you know, so let's figure it out. And that, those are the hard parts. You know, those are the hour and a half long conversations at the end of service that you have to, you know, that you have yeah. to get through or the call them in an hour and a half early for that convo. Hey, I need you to come in and talk. And then, you know, it's those sorts of things that as a, as a manager, if you really want to work on staff retention, that you have to put yourself through and you have to really look at those people and discuss your differences. In, a, in an industry where um, staffing is so slim currently <laughs> and has been for some time, I know just as anecdotally I've observed when I've talked to chefs, cooks, servers, soms that have said, you know, at X place, I loved that GM. I loved that chef. I loved that manager. <coughs> I would follow her or him anywhere. And that's vital <laughs> as, as you build a new restaurant, mm -hmm. as you, you know, recruit talent mm -hmm. from a difficult pool where there's a lot of other options as you move forward. Um, so I want to I want to put out one last question, uh, like a, a, a working question to sure. all three of you, and then I'm going to open up for questions <coughs> because I'm I'm sure that uh, you have questions as well. So you've got someone in your organization that is clearly struggling with depression or um, heading towards alcoholism. Let's just call it. Like, mm -hmm. You know, you you feel that. What do you do? Just each one of you. You start the conversation. Mm -hmm. No matter what it is, if it's a, hey, how you doing, uh, you start dialogue. I think a lot of people, when that happens, you say, all right, we're taking you right down to the clinic. We're going we're gonna to go zero to 60 uh, as where we say, let's just take the first step mm -hmm. and let's start stepping. Uh, and you'd be surprised just how much you can get done when you look back at all the steps you've taken, and maybe in a day, in a week, um, but if you focus on getting the conversation started, because what that does is it's communication. And that's the only way we get through anything as a restaurant is communication, understanding people's needs, whether that be depression uh, or alcoholism, both of which, if somebody's working to conceal that and hide that, can be a little hard to, to um, translate and understand. So once you get those red flags, though, the I don't know, is that I'm, you know, <clears throat> I'm doing fine, or whatever, you know, or it's coming in smelling like booze, all that but stuff. Yeah. That know. little bit of attention is really important, like you oh, said. Oh, my goodness, it's like, yeah. yeah it's, it goes a long way. And if you do smother them, that, that does push them away. So you have to be pretty careful about it, you know. And there, there's so much that you can do, and, but starting the conversation is a big part of it. And, you know, finding out what it is with them and they might not give you every detail but you know for them just to be able to talk or get it off mm -hmm. you know is is, mm -hmm. is a big step in it you know there's employee assistant programs that come with insurance and those are really important and those are you know you you find people who do use those and you know i i have several chefs that i have recommended it to and some have used it some have, have not and but it's it's important to start the conversation with them, and it's important for them to also want to, you know, take that step into to, to having the, the assistance. And, mm -hmm. you know, but definitely the, the most important part is, is recognizing it and starting the conversation with them. Because if you don't, then nothing's ever going to happen. They're just going to keep showing up, and, you know, right. they'll have their good days, and they'll, you know, their bad days will continue on. Drifting deeper, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nobody drinks because they're thirsty. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, no, <laughs> at that at that scale, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I think, like any other uh, concern of, of of such a degree, a person needs to admit they have a problem. Mm. So you, through this conversation, you need to bring the person to pause and say, okay, this is not recreational anymore, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. alcohol or drugs. Because if they keep putting their head in the sand, it doesn't matter how much support you're going to give yeah. them. A person right. needs to come to a point when they say, I, I have a problem. Uh, we did a, a very intimate uh, forum in New York with 40 uh, people from the industry, and we had a psychologist who was part of Fair Kitchens uh, on the panel with, with other chefs, and he talked about abuse, drug abuse, and alcohol abuse, and the signs, and what can, can cause, and at the end, one, one chef from Boston, actually, that came all the way down, came and said, I'm the problem. Mm. I 
I thought it's my team. I thought it's up till now. I didn't. I did not see that this is me. I'm the issue. I need help. You need to bring somebody to at least pause and say, "Do I need help?" Mm -hmm. um, and that starts by conversation. But I think also as anyone who leads a team, know what the resource available in your area. Not everybody has an HR department or the means to give health insurance. Small establishments may not be able to give those benefits or, or help subsidize uh, um, uh, a session or, or, or anything with, with a, a professional. But there are non-for-profit organizations everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, know how to line them up, at least two or three. That, so if you do recognize and somebody says, admits that they may need help, you can tell them, okay, here, here is what we can do. And, Here's some resources. And take that step with that person. Do not expect that that person will do that leap on their own. Right. It's a huge emotional toll to look inside and say, I have a problem. And then it takes much more to say, okay, I'm also going to address it. Mm -hmm. Hold them by their hand, make the first call with them, connect them, and check on on them. Don't let them, up. Oh, I did that, help, right. moving on. Yeah. You know, very important. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is, is we fail to realize that there's this deep human side. When people have those issues, the serious depression, the, you know, the abuse, and we, we're always like, how, oh, why? They've got it going. They've got such a great, you know. Yeah. They've got everything to live for. He's such and, a great host. He's yeah. so terrific on the line. They're, always cracking jokes, whatever it, it is, yeah. It really has nothing to do with the, the, the love that, you know, the fact that everybody loves them and thinks um, that they're doing a great job. That's It almost has nothing to do with it. It's the fact that they don't love who they are. Right. <clears throat> um, well, those and, are often de deflective measures. Exactly. Yeah. And, and um, that's one of the hardest things to combat as, an out, as somebody on, on the outside. And mm -hmm. you really have to find your way to connect to those people. Um, to keep them going, because yeah. when people get into that into that spot in their life, as you know, serious as it sounds, sometimes they don't come back the next day. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, we've seen that a lot this mm -hmm. year. Uh, you know, so. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you for your candor and for your insights. Uh, I'm I'm hoping there's questions for, uh, just because this is such a an important topic. Yes, if you could stand up so that everyone can hear and. Project as if you're singing to the back uh, of, of Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. you're, you're talking uh, essentially about something that's a health problem. And I appreciate what you're saying, but the access they actually need is to see a counselor or a mental health professionals. And a lot of times the insurance is not going to pay for that or they don't have the money for that. And if they have the money and the insurance, it's at least a three-month wait for more to actually get to see someone because the services are just so overloaded now and our insurance is not paying the health professionals enough money for people to want to get into that field. So I, I appreciate what you're saying, but uh, being a friend for somebody who has a deep problem isn't going to solve like the deep issue that they have. They <coughs> Care for that. No, but it's going to help uh, push them in the right direction, hopefully, and that's part of it. You know, is 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 letting them know that there are <clears throat> that it is a problem, it is a health problem, and that they do need to seek help. In something like an employee assistance program, there's other helplines out there that are free and everything. And it, anything that they can do that's going to be a positive to push them in the right direction is important. You know, we you can't just be a buddy and expect somebody to to be cured overnight. No, that's not going to happen. But being there for people and being human with somebody and recognizing them is, is a step in the, in the right direction. It's part of being positive and part of you know, letting them know that, that it's not all doom and gloom. But you, do, you are right. It, it is a health issue that needs to be addressed. I, I would also, I mean, I, I respect uh, you standing up and, and expressing that. I think um, I can, I can just think about three or four employees that we have at the restaurant who have their own mental health problems. Um, and the, from the very first time that we, that I found that out or we were given that information or they let us know that about them, within days we had them talking to a therapist, within days. Uh, and I think that when people realize, urgency is a big thing. Um, if somebody told me it was a three-month waiting period, I'm going to the next person. Uh, and and for, for the three employees that do have 
um, you know, these issues. I mean, we got them going right away. Some of them didn't have money for it. We'll put that up for it. You know, like if you're not, the thing I'm trying to say is, if you're not doing everything you can, then I guess that is the result um, as a person. Um, and if you're in a leadership position in a restaurant or not in a leadership position as a restaurant, if somebody gives you that information and has that cry out, whether it's a small little peep or it's a, hey, I'm gonna go kill myself tonight. And you know what? It's weird saying that out loud, but people say that. You know, uh, I'm texting with a professional, <clears throat> um, a good buddy of mine who, who is suicidal, wife is leaving him, jobs on the, on the fritz, all this stuff, and I just can't submit to the idea that the fact that I'm just conversing with him and talking with him and giving him uh, uplifting words of how he can get help and all these sorts of things, while he's going and seeing somebody, of course, but, but I can't allow myself to say, ah, the system's broken. You know, it's, uh, I can't do that anymore. Uh, especially, you know, what I've put myself through. I, can't, I, I would not be able to go to sleep every night if I just said, well, that's the way the world uh, is. Every day I'm fighting for that. And I don't give myself a choice. That's it. That's the bottom line for me. So, um, yeah, our system is a little bit broken. Yes, these people need health. You know, this is a health issue itself. Yes, the greater American health care system is going through some <clears throat> issues right now, but that doesn't deter me from saving, I mean, one person, you know. Yeah. I'm going to do everything I possibly can. I, I would echo that because I've had my own battles with depression and, and uh, this year finally submitted to pharmacology and it was... I'm self-employed, so we are on and off insurance. We finally got insurance. It was a three-month wait. I got into someone that I thought it was the most perfunctory appointment ever, and I'm very suspect of being prescribed things, but I have to say that Lexapro has literally saved my life. Mm -hmm. uh, the dark men do not come around, and I could set my calendar to it. Every three and a half mm -hmm. weeks, my wife would begin to see the cycle. And it's true, if I didn't have her and a few other people saying, Here's a phone call, here's a number you can call, here's a thing. Here's basically, there's, these are free resources along the way, and we'll make some space for you when, when these chemical things come around until something happens, until you get some actual help. But um, it, it's, it's, it is doable. If you give in, then you or your network have given in. And, Look, I'm very fortunate. I live in a large metro metropolitan area, that sort of thing. If you're out in the middle of rural America, I can't imagine how daunting it is. But I knew, do know that there's free phone numbers, and there were calls that I could get in, get on with people that struggled with the same things, and just having that simpatico would change my attitude for the entire day, and then the next day, and that's all I had to take care of was that day. <clears throat> The suicide hotline, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, if you've ever spoken to them, Absolutely. is one of the greatest resources. Mm -hmm. You can call them up any time of the day, and it's or not night. just for people who are at that point where they're going to take their own life. It's for people who, it's also for people who are privy to that information about somebody, and they don't know what to do. Right. And yeah. they have great resources when you call the suicide, the, I think it's the National yes. Suicide Hotline. Mm -hmm. I mean, the... They really know what they're doing, and that's like one of those first lines of, you know, hey, oh man, you know, I'm really worried about this person. What are things that I can do? Yeah. And they will, they literally will give you a just bullet by bullet. They by also bullet direct by towards bullet. 12-step programs yeah. in the area, and th I yeah. mean, it's really they're it's trained. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. It's so um, I'm sure there's other questions. Uh, anyone? Mm -hmm. Yes, in the back. Do you have any suggestions on how to prevent burnout? Because the staff does such long hours. Um. We, so we're closed on Mondays and Tuesdays. So when Chef and I were putting this, re the, the restaurant, we opened this restaurant a year and a half ago. Um, I, I, I mean, I've been working in the restaurant industry for 17 years and up, and it's taken me 17 years to actually say, wow, this is when you need to leave work. This is when <laughs> you, like, this is when you need to go to work. But <clears throat> there's no reason why we can't fight to condense, it's a little harder on the chef side, but to condense things into 40 hours a week. Why can't we do that? Why can't we make things incredibly um, efficient? And why can't we really get the output for all of our employees down, down to those hours? Um, I'm, I, I'm guilty, I work over 40 hours a week every week, uh, but we have clear barriers. On Mondays and Tuesdays, you're not in the restaurant. 
force yourself to be out of the restaurant. Um, we, I mean, you have to do some form of physical exercise. is is so huge to stay sane in the mm -hmm. in the business. Um, you have to do some sort of. You have to outside of the restaurant. You have to find a way to inspire yourself, um, and that's specific to every single person. I go out and I ride my bike, and that's what I and and that's what I do, and and that's how I let that energy out. My girlfriend, she goes to boxing every day and punches things, which is, uh, you know, <laughs> she gets it out, you know, and she works in the business too. That, and, it's, and, amazing, it's, like, it's amazingly it's, therapeutic, by the way. Everyone in yeah. this industry should have a kickboxing gym somewhere near their restaurant. And, and this burnout <laughs> thing comes, this burnout thing comes from the, I've got to get back into work because there's never, there's never an end to your list mm -hmm. as a chef, especially mm -hmm. as a chef or a front of house manager or anything like that. And you have to say, no, the list stops here today. And you have to have that self-control. Um, my dad would say it all the time, you know, if you have to put what, what you didn't get done off to tomorrow, that's okay. And if you did everything you can today, you know, and you still get fired tomorrow, well, then you did everything you could. Um, and I think we have that fear of if I, a lot of us have that fear of if I don't get this next thing done, oh my God, I might get fired tomorrow. Right. Or, or you have that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. How you just, you, you have that like, I can't stop a lot sort of, of feeling. But a lot of the, you know, to prevent the burnout comes with, you know, writing a, you know, as chefs or managers writing a smart schedule, mm -hmm. making sure that, you know, for the, you know, the, the people, that, the staff that's not servers who, who determine their own mm -hmm. wage almost, but making sure that, you know, you're, you're giving fair wages so that they don't have to work two or three jobs sometimes. And, you know, that's where they experience a lot of the burnout in, in this day and age is, you know, we'll only schedule them 40 hours here, but then they might be working another 20 or 30 hours somewhere else. And, you know, if you can make, make sure that they don't have to work those, you know, full 20 or 30 hours somewhere else, that's really important is to prevent burnout. And that comes with, you know, some of the organization that you set in the kitchen so that you don't have to have this tremendous workload on a daily basis. It, you know, as, as the chef or the manager, you have to create what the workload's going to be and to spread it out over a certain amount of time makes it much easier for the staff. Yeah. You know, not everything needs to be done every single day, you, you pick and choose what needs to be done on those days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think it comes from leadership too. I mean, if you would take days off, mm -hmm. it empowers your team that it's okay to take a day off. Um, you know, in New York City, many places are open seven days a week just to make up for the rent in the city. Unfortunately, it may not be an option for them to close for a day or two, but then run your staff, run your operation efficiently so you can give people time off and make sure that they take the time off. It's really important to disconnect, mm -hmm. if, even if it's for one evening a week mm -hmm. and do something else. Mm -hmm. um, y you know, we, we, we talk to chefs and encourage them to do some sort of a bartering, if it's a small operation, with restaurants across and do almost like a, a, a dining voucher. Mm -hmm. So you can take a friend and dine, you know, somewhere else, one evening. It's also good for their growth, uh, professional growth, to see something else. You know, you, know you, you work it out with a few restaurants in your area and they taste something else, they out, they're having a nice dinner, and you do the same. You know, it, it's a, it again, may sound small, but it's a token of appreciation and it's also um, making sure that your team is just clearing their head and having a life outside of this uh, operation and so they come refreshed back in. And when you're off. Yeah. Stay off. Stay off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, Easy said than done. But yeah. And I heard this within, within, when I hear something from two separate areas within two weeks, I figure like that's, you know, God talking or something. But I heard it from my therapist and I heard it from a, a really famous chef who both asked me, what are your hobbies? And I said, uh, I, we go out to eat because that is something my wife and I do and we explore and that's, it's, that's pathetic. Both of them basically <laughs> said that's pathetic. <laughs> I don't care if it's model railroading, I don't, like, I don't, whatever it is. What, what do you do that's separate from what you do for a living? Because you're a dad and you're a partner and then you're this food personality. And what, what the hell else is there? And It's that ability to, to take your mind off yeah, the mm -hmm. restaurant. Yeah, yeah. That's what it kind right. of boils down to. And reading you know, a magazine at the end of the night does not qualify as a hobby, right? You know. Mm -hmm. So um, if you can imbue that into your staff or find it for yourself, I think it's really valuable. I'm sure there's more questions. Yes? In dealing with um, 
you know, human emotions that we have to deal with in our staff as leaders. How do you balance, and, and this is more for like the, corp, the bigger corporations where you're part of something else, how do you balance the take the emotion out of it <laughs> when you're talking to your staff with the emotions that everybody has? That's yeah. a great question. I, I, I look at it like I deal with my stuff at home, you know, you have crappy days in the office and I really try <laughs> on the short drive home to segregate it before I get home so I won't bring it, you know, to husband and kids. Um, and, and it's kind of it's kind of the same, you know, for me personally, and that's usually why I advise my, my teams of chef as well. It's for first asking what is, why am I so charged? Why it gets me so aggravated? Acknowledge that, park that, because this is not, you know, bringing those emotions in, probably not going to get you far uh, in, into the conversation. So I think it's a lot of self-reflection. Um, if we run an operation, certainly bigger, bigger operations too, part of a bigger system, there has to be some accountability as, as a human being and some self-reflection on, okay, what, what exactly is the driver for this and what am I trying to get? Yeah, there are days when you're like, oh, you know, I, 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 this person drives me up a wall, you know, but, but you, I can't like tell this person, you're driving me up a wall. And I say, listen, this, it's just not work. You have to put it in, in a means that somebody will understand what you are trying to get out of it. But it's also knowing to maybe carry the same conversation in different ways. We're different people. You know, it's uh, managing different people, doesn't matter if it's a kitchen or a restaurant, you need to be able to have the same message spoken in different ways. So people that, have, that may hear things differently can essentially hear you. We also have a rule too where if, if it's anything that has a negative connotation to the discussion that you're about to have, it's always done in private, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And it's one-on-one -on -one usually, or if, there's, mm. if it involves more people, it's always in private. The only thing that we do uh, as a staff <coughs> publicly in front of guests, in front of other staff members, is, is positive praise. Hey, you did a good job here. This is fantastic. And if there's a critique that you need to have with any, sort, any one person, uh, whether that be an equal or somebody below you, it's always one-on-one, -on -one. hey, can I just real quick talk to you downstairs or, or outside real quick? And you wouldn't believe the, uh, the success you have with that because then th they're willing to work with you because you just did for them you know, a, a huge favor to, to, to take them outside or go to the office and, and, and have a private conversation about it as opposed to a, why'd you do this? You know, that whole embarrassment thing, which I'm sure all of us in some, in this, in this room have been subject to at some point in our career, restaurant industry or not. And it's so demoralizing when, you, mm. when those things happen. Uh, those are one of the big things that we always do. It's you know, uh, praise in public and you know, punish in private. That's, and it just goes a long way um, when you're able to, to, to put those yeah. two things apart from each other. Hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, here and then here about um, some of the bigger components in terms of developing a team and um, developing their positive interaction with their teammates. What are some of the small things you do for employees to recognize birthdays, work anniversaries, things like that to help build morale? The employee birthday, that's the toughest one. Uh, for, you first have to have all of their birthdays in one central location. Um, our, thank God our POS system actually <coughs> reminds us <laughs> It sends me a list of whose birthdays are that week because it's not, it's not because I'm insensitive or I don't care, but the restaurant is just so busy that's like you forget about birthdays. So, um, you know, the birthday is huge. It's always, if somebody has a birthday, it's always recognized every, every single pre-shift that, uh, uh, you know, day of. Um, some people, you know, depending on who it is, will get them a cake or something special specific to them. Uh, and that goes a long way, I think. Just simple Absolutely. recognition mm -hmm. of, of, hey, it's yeah. your special day. And uh, work anniversaries, you know, mm -hmm. those are really important to recognize. Our company, you know, our, our owner gives you a check, you know, for, for a five-year work anniversary, 10 years, 15 years. And, you know, he, it, yeah. he, may, he gives you a plaque with it to make sure that you, you know, and he usually tries to get there to, to hand deliver it. And, when, you know, you have 800 employees and people know that it, it, it means something you know, that recognition and just, you know, but even beyond that, it's just 
the every day of saying hi to or goodbye to somebody is, is really what makes the biggest difference. Give that a try if any of you are in a position to be able to do that. Uh, it's so much harder than you think it is. To, <laughs> because there have been, even just for me, there have been days where I just want to get the heck out of there. You know, mm. you, got, you got put to the meat grinder, terrible. I mean, the other day we had six celiacs come in in, in one night. And, I, and <laughs> I remember Chef and I talking how if that was even statistically possible. I, I love that uh, it's become what, an adjective. Yeah. Right? And, right. And, <laughs> and if there's a celiac here, then I, you know, I mean, it, it's hard because you, you have to take it so seriously. Yeah. Uh, and I was just, you know, I was just about to go nuts and pull my hair out because it, you, you, <laughs> you literally have to stop service every time that ticket comes up and when it's sick. But to, to be done with all of that and then to still go to every single employee and say, hey, Monica, have a great night. <laughs> Chef, have a wonderful night. Thank you very much. Isaiah, thank you very much. And go through that. It just, it seals the day, it seals things up. It says, all right, we got it. Mm -hmm. We wrapped it up. Yep. Boom. All right, what's the, where's the next one? Right. And, and it's amazing how just that little thing works. Uh, and it's one of, it's so small, yeah. you know, but it's so huge. Yeah. So. Sir? How do you feel about people who are feeling stagnant about themselves in the workforce? What was it? I'm sorry, what was it? How do you feel about people who are feeling stagnant about themselves in the workforce? Ooh, stagnancy in the workforce is a tough one too. Yeah, it's... The, uh, stagnancy is a tough one. There's a lot of kids out there today. We have a lot of kids that are 21 to 24 uh, who have been doing one position for about five or six months now. And I've had a conversation with three of them. Uh, and they're all expos, Emily, Michael, and, uh, uh, and Maria. And they're all like, hey, I got it. I'm good at expo. Let's Wait, do the what's next. next. What's yeah. next? And I'm, and I'm sitting, and meanwhile, I'm like, all right, do it for two and a half more years, you know, and then we'll move on to the next, uh, next thing. So you have to, you have to constantly, in, the inspiration is huge. Uh, you have to inspire, you have to let these kids know where they're going. You know, and you have to give them those goals. Maria, who is an expo right now, she was a, a year ago, she was a barista, she moved up to host and now she's expo. And she knows, I have eye to eye communication with her all the time saying, hey, this is the path you're on to be the next, to be the general manager you wanna be. You know, and she real, and if I can put that all in perspective and say this is your path, as opposed to this is just where you are right now, you know, and say, hey, five years from now, you better be that next GM I'm looking for, you know, and constantly giving each staff member that next goal to work for so they know where they're going is huge, as opposed to just coming in every day and saying, hi, how you doing, and this is your job as a line cook or a dishwasher or so on and so forth. Also, you know, when you're on your station, you know, or the area that you work, strive for that perfection because in, you know, three, four, five, six months, you're, you know, there's, always that room for improvement and the better that you get at something the more you've repeated it the the better that you're going to become when it comes time to go back to that station mm -hmm. or to do, move on to the next one because it, you, you know from yeah you might not be able to know how to make this one dish inside and out but you know learn the next dish inside and out and then pay attention to the mm -hmm. station that's next to you and then you know just really perfect on your organization can you make this dish and keep your station as clean as possible and organized as possible? And then, you know, those are all the, the things that you need to work on being, you know, for fine tuning. And that helps with, with that stagnant feeling because, you know, if you move too fast, you never fully learn what is, you know, involved with everything. And, you know, yeah, it's, sometimes it it's, could be a downer when you don't move through things as fast as you want to. I remember when years and years ago when I worked at, uh, in Chicago, and I wanted to keep moving and move on to the next thing, move on to the next thing, and you know I wasn't allowed to because I had to continue to learn on the one station that I was working at. But it, you know I also paid attention and I looked at what was going on next to me. I also made sure that what I was doing was going to be as perfect as possible. And I got to the point to where you know when I worked myself to that level on the station, that's always when I was you know moved or. You know, I felt, you know, that, that level of satisfaction that really, you know, was a positive feeling. And moving up also, I, I, I think I can track most of the, the, the um, promotions that I got 
to like single opportunities that were given to me by chance. Mm. Uh, somebody didn't mm -hmm. show up on a certain mm -hmm. day. Uh, or I, I remember one of my, uh, before I was, became the beverage manager uh, at, at Bristol, we had boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of wine in our wine cellar and our beverage director, Jason, was just, he was in the weeds. He had so much he had to do uh, that he couldn't get to it. And I just asked, I said, hey, you mind if I organize this? You know, and I did, and I stayed there until four in the morning, organized the whole wine cellar, made it perfect, and the next day I came in, and Dave Johnston, my mentor, was said, okay, you're ready to be, you're ready to be the wine director now. Right. Uh, and, and it was, I can trace them back to those like mm -hmm. instant moments where, where it wasn't really my job to do it, but I wanted to show people it was my job, to, that, that I could do it. And I didn't, it was nothing, it was nothing I had to do, it was nothing that was required of me. It showed you care, it wasn't yeah. just a job, it shows you care. Yeah. Which is a big those opportunities, I mean, man, yeah. they give you such a great jump. Uh, Ten th the 10,000 hour rule can never be underestimated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm 49 and I can tell you there's no shortcut. <laughs> I tried all of them. <laughs> And there's, there's no shortcut. No, we're still in the profession of honing skills. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there is still repetition that needs to be done for you to perfect something. But we're also, for better and worse, in an industry there where things are so dynamic. So even in the kitchen, people go in and out, seize an opportunity. Talk to your chef, say, I'm, I'm very interested in doing the line or doing something. At least put your wishes out there. Don't wait till somebody comes and offer that to you and put it out there. And when an opportunity presents itself, say, can I, can I try? Um, learn when you can. If, if what you do is quiet, your station is quiet, observe the other station and start learning uh, what is going on. And I think on, on a managerial or the leadership point of view is pave a path. Say, guys, I need you. It will be an, a year and a half or a couple of years on the Gardman J and then, you know, pave a path so people will know, will know what they're looking at um, and get into an experience with eyes wide open. Also, I would say, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm parallel to the industry, but not in it, but uh, all of the GM, some chefs that, that I really want to talk to beyond a cursory have been lifelong learners. They read history books about cuisine or wine. They went home and read other cookbooks. They, you know, when they travel, they're, they're, they're going somewhere and trying the crazy tandoori chicken or whatever. Like, they are lifelong learners. And that has, in all cases, has taken them on a path that they never expected, but it spoke to something that was more authentic inside that they didn't even realize was there. And, uh, I always said yes before I knew what I was saying yes to. Right. <laughs> when anybody asked me of anything, there would be times all the time where Dave would say, hey, I need you to come in and do a double today or something. And I would just be like, yes. And I always remember five minutes after, I was like, well, that was real stupid. <laughs> but, but, but then I showed up, you know, and I was there. And the fact that yes just came out of my mouth as opposed to trying to find like, you know, oh, I just can't do it. I, oh, I, just, I got something going on or this and that. I just said yes, and I made it happen. And all of those moments where you just said yes, and you just did it, and you figured it out, mm -hmm. um, and kind of learned by doing, create just some of the greatest opportunities for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, but that's hard to do. It's hard to just say yes. Let's take one more question because it turns out there's the rest of the show out there. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. How long or when do you say, listen, we can't help you anymore? <clears throat> Oh, it's a great question. Uh, and just this employee, just, you can't help it. How long do you keep them along? And how do you let them go? I think, it, I think it depends on the individual and like exactly what's, what's wrong with them. But if it's bringing harm or affecting your business, you have to make some, some harder decisions. You know? But it doesn't mean that if they're not a part of your business that you still can't help them. You know, that's something that, that's really important is that, you know, after, you know, you know if, if they're removed from the business, there's still things that you could do for them and things that they can do for themselves. But, you know, when it, when it comes time to, you know, when it comes down to them affecting the business and them affecting the culture or, you know, anything to do in there, it's something that you have to address almost immediately. There's, that's kind of... That's a really big gray area um, that I don't necessarily mind living in um, at, at the restaurant. You just have to understand 
I think our line is physical harm. Mm -hmm. when, it, when it comes down to physical harm right. uh, and, and like immediate kind of stuff like that within the restaurant, then you got to part ways. But that doesn't mean, <clears throat> like, like you said, that doesn't mean you, that you stop that right. re relationship. There's a guy who got, who got fired for uh, getting just absolutely bombed at, a, at an event uh, at one of the restaurants I used to work at. Uh, and he actually worked with, with Leslie too. Uh, um, where? At Publican? No. Yep. No. Somewhere. Uh, and and he had since got he had since got fired for the same thing. It's just incredibly destructive behavior. Um, and he had our numbers and would text us and all this stuff all the time. And you know, you still went that extra mile to get them the help. And we connected. And Leslie was able to connect him with you know a therapist that you know that hopefully helped. And and there you know there you go. Um, it's. It, it never ends, really. Yeah. You kind of have to go all the way, good or bad. And and sometimes, you know, there's you just you can't get through to people. Mm -hmm. You know, we've we've I've experienced that where I just couldn't get through to somebody, and they continued on their path. And you know, it's, you you, you kind of have to sometimes accept that for what it is that you can't. You know, you're you're not going to be a savior. You're not going to be able to, you know, solve everyone's problems or issues in life. And Sometimes it's, you know, they're an adult and it's their own, you know, mm -hmm. problem that they have to go through or sometimes you just have to notify their family and, you know, it has to be a family issue from that point, you know. And there's no reason to beat your own self up for exactly. that. Exactly. You no, can't, you the can't. The second you do that, you that's, can't, you can't you know. make it, it your, your own problem, you know, because then, then you could risk dragging yourself down or not being there for everybody else that needs you. Mm -hmm. And I can say just personally, in the hospitality industry and then outside, I've been fired twice in my life and two, both, they were the best things that could have happened to me. Mm -hmm. And one was from the hospitality industry. And I was, you know, dead man walking. I, I had no business serving people because it was all about me at the time and I was burned out. And uh, I came back to it later and was some of my happiest days in the industry. But I needed a break. I was a terrible server. I should have been fired. <laughs> that makes really good sense. Just, just because if I have to terminate this person, doesn't mean our relationship has to. Right. No, yeah. and, uh, to, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yeah, and to your point, I'm still friends with that restaurant, those restaurant owners. Literally saw them this summer and huge hugs and, mm -hmm. you know, delighted you're married and, like, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much thank for you. your time. Thank you, panel. Thank you.